the primordial one, the almighty saints, the first ascender, vanquisher of dragons, master of the four shades, creator of the entire human realm, the original god that brought about all of Tevat. Or did they? What if I told you that the primordial one isn't actually faints? What if I told you that they aren't a descender or even a real creator? What if they aren't a true god at all? I know, I know, but bear with me for a second because I can make it worse. What if I told you that we do know who the primordial one is and that we have known them all along? Because they may be none other than the first hair from the battle pass. If you think I'm delusional right now, you are completely right, but stick with me and by the end you may just find that it is the primordial one who has been delusional this whole time. But before we dive in, I need to remind you that this is part 2 of my Slash's Origins theory. You can follow along with this part only, but part 1 contains a lot of important background information about reason, delusion and the nature of Tevat, so I'll link it up in the cards, description and pinned comment in case you want to check it out. So today, on the Defendant's Table, we have the Primordial One, who is being accused of not being a real god, not being a descender, and not actually being faints. Let us start off with the first accusation then. Could the Primordial One not be a real god? Yeah, really, the deeper I look into it, the more impossible it seems that they are one. It's just that the way they are described is full of contradiction, starting with their wings. And no, I'm not saying that having wings is a disqualifying factor of divinity. Barbatus is a god, a demon god, but a god regardless, and he has wings. The statue of the omnipresent god in Inazuma, who might be the likeness of Istaroth, also has wings. And according to Istaroth's scribe in Before Sun and Moon, the primordial one might have been Fanes, a Greek deity that did very much have wings. Mythology offers us various versions of exactly who Fanes was and how he came around. But what remains pretty constant was that he emerged from the abyss, was birthed from a silver egg while intertwined with a serpent, and created the universe. So he is the creator deity. He was said to have an androgynous figure and two large golden wings. He is also known as a god of goodness and light. On top of that, like gods often do, he goes by several names, including Metis, which is actually also the name of an Oceanid and means thought. That's going to be very important later, keep it in mind. What has never sat well with me, though, is how does Missive describe is of these feigns in Before Sin and Moon. Oh, they exalt the primordial one, alright, but then follow it up with they might have been feigns, which is bizarre because we know that Celestia was in direct contact with the unified civilization until a second throne came around. The celestial envoys that were set to walk among humanity were likely the Sili, but I'm pretty sure that they also had direct contact with the Shades at least, and not just Isaroth, because the Sili likely fell before the war with the Second Throne, or at the very least, before Inkanomiya was plunged into the depths, because the Sunken Nation has Sili courts everywhere, and they are in much better shape than the ones in the overworld due to having less elemental exposure. But if this is a correct timeline, the people of Inkanomiya would know what the Sili had been reduced to, because they could see them. So when the scribe claims that the gods had forsaken them with the exception of Istaroth, they mustn't have been talking about the celestial envoys. What was left of them was still around after all. They must have been talking about the shades themselves. And they knew that there were four shades. They at least knew that one was the god of time and another the god of life. And you are telling me that they didn't even know the name of their creator deity? Press X to doubt. The Primordial One made a covenant with humanity, and you are telling me that they either never saw them, or never cared enough to pass down the tale to the future generations? At the very least, you would think the Sili or the Shades would have told humanity the name of their creator, but no, instead they might be faints. I think this is deception. Very purposeful deception. We will circle back to this, but for now let us consider the possibility that the Primordial One might not be Fanes. After all, the real Fanes was a primeval god, and the Primordial One might not be a god at all. And all because of their wings. Fontaine really is in the business of dissing gods like their life depends on it. First it was Nouvellet, then Jacob. And now there are too many hints for me to dismiss this as a red herring. Please listen to this very spiteful voice line of Nouvellet's. Since you hail from beyond the stars, I invite you to be my witness as I judge this upended world. 
this realm dismantled was of the formidable father himself, but what now reigns here is a cluster of filthy feathers. Though we live in a world of disarray, I shall undertake to restore all that has been broken. If you think this Heavenly Father was a weird name drop, it's because it is. We had never heard it used before or since, but given the context, it seems like it must be referring to Nibelung. The important part here, though, are these filthy feathers, and how they are contrasted against a being that seems far more divine. This feathered individual is obviously none other than the primordial one, and Jacob describes them in a very similar way. He stated, This was once the realm of a god. Now a pheasant sits upon the throne, just like the real world today. He goes from commenting about the Ordo to Devat itself, and he claims that the throne that once was occupied by an actual god has been taken over by a pheasant, a type of bird. But not just any bird, because pheasants are said to symbolize, among other things, imagination. Regardless, birds have feathers, which means that twice now, the fact that the primordial one has wings has been put under the spotlight and used as a metaphor to diminish their supposed divinity. And that's not a surprise, because even in Before Sun and Moon, they are described as being a throne of the heavens, with thrones being a class of angels according to Christian angelology. But angels aren't gods, they are servants, the servants of God. And it just so happens that the primordial one also directly references one specific servant of the Christian God, Noah. In a nutshell, God was really disappointed with his creation ten generations after the first humans were brought into being. Humanity was full of corruption, so he decided to do a hard reset and send a massive flood to cover the entire world. But the goal was to restart everything anew, not to completely wipe life out. So he tasked Noah with building an ark where he was to gather two specimens, a male and a female, of every species as well as his own family, with the goal of repopulating the earth from the microcosm of his ark once the water levels lowered. Did you notice how this perfectly matches the wording in Before Sun and Moon? Tevat means Ark, and we are told that the Primordial One separated the microcosm of the world from the rest of the universe by creating the dome-like barrier around the planet. But the similarities don't end there, because Noah only knew that it was finally safe to leave the Ark once he sent out a dove to look for land and it returned carrying an olive branch in its beak. Only then could he start to build the world anew by repopulating it. Meanwhile, according to Scribe, the world was made anew when the primordial one arrived and that period of time is known as when the doves held branches. On top of that, once the whole ordeal was over, God created a rainbow as a promise to his people that he would never again flood the earth. A rainbow has seven colors, and under Celestia's rule there are seven archons, seven gods that claim the celestial throne. Those thrones appear to have only been created when the noses were made, and in turn, those were only made because heavenly principles were severely weakened and could no longer fight against the natural order of Tivat. They could no longer sustain the world they had made. So just like God sent out that rainbow with seven colors to let everyone know he would no longer destroy the world to restart it, heavenly principles established the order of seven to prevent the world from being destroyed. In a way, the Archons are the rainbow. There are very clear parallels here, right? So, between the primordial one being likened to a servant and contrasted against gods, it's only fair that we question whether they really are a true god or not. Still, this isn't enough to prove anything. Yet, we will get there. For now though, let's turn to the second accusation. The primordial one isn't a descender. By definition, a descender is a being that originates from somewhere outside of Tivat and who possesses a will that can rival an entire world, destroy an entire world and or create an entire world. And going off what we discussed in part 1, this descender's will should be reason, something that is capable of all that creation and destruction. But reason is only half of a whole, because the only thing you need in order to create is imagination. You imagine something, you believe it, will it, and it manifests in reality your beliefs create. If they are true beliefs, you are creating on the basis of reason. If your beliefs are false, you are creating on the basis of delusion. But we also discussed how delusion seems to be associated with the abyss, which is what makes it so dangerous. 
This also makes sense because René claimed that while elemental energy is stable and lacks a will, abyssal energy is a whole other monster. It possesses a will, which is probably why it is so destructive and why it is capable of having a corruptive influence even on abyssal creatures. Reason, however, cuts through delusion like a blade. So the sender shouldn't have any trouble getting rid of abyssal delusion. And in fact, we got to see the Traveler purify the Valiant's tears without any effort. They purify delusion. Meanwhile, Nahida claims that Heavenly Principles is probably the first Ascender. She can't be sure of it since the Ascenders aren't recorded by Erminsoul, but it is a well-educated guess. However, I want to point out that you don't need to be a Ascender to be invisible to Erminsoul. The Abyss Twin isn't one, but somehow someone is shielding them from the tree, preventing their actions from being recorded. So just because you can't see someone in the records, that doesn't automatically mean that they are the sender. If they were to wield a reason, on the other hand, then yes, you could be pretty sure of it. But Heavenly Principles can't use reason. We established that reason and the Abyss really don't get along, to the point where the Traveler can't even access the Void Realm through rifts and portals. So, when the second who came invaded Teyvat and brought with them a tide of delusion that destroyed the land and sickened the people with plagues, you would think that, as a descender, Heavenly Principles would simply be able to use reason to dispel those delusions. But that's not what they did. First and foremost, Celestial Energy is blue, not golden like the Travelers. Not a deal breaker though, we can't be sure that reason manifests in the same way for every descender. So just because the Divine Nails are blue in color, that doesn't mean they aren't imbued with reason. The problem is that they don't actually cut through abyssal energy. They don't dispel delusion. The dark mud we find in the chasm is a result of the interaction between the nails and abyssal energy. The mud is simply a more neutral form of this energy, perhaps stripped of its will. Meanwhile, the traveler is capable of getting rid of all traces of abyssal corruption. Still, the nails did something, even if they weren't completely efficient. And that something was a whole lot of destruction. The Second Throne brought delusions with them and thus spread destruction in Tevat. Meanwhile, the Primordial Ones sent down the nails and achieved the same result. A lot of forbidden knowledge was neutralized, even if not removed, but there doesn't seem to be a reason for the nails to be as destructive as they are. Unless they were also created by delusion. According to Nabu Malikata, one of the Sili, a god is said to have been created by the Primordial One directly, one who knew the celestial gods. The primordial one is delusional. The artifact said Flowers of Paradise Lost gave us this absolute bomb of a quote. Dreams will always dissolve. Their landscapes fated to collapse. This is the true meaning of the blooming flowers. Only by suffering through the destruction of a god's delusions can humanity learn to rise against divine will. This has massive implications. For one, it validates the Order's beliefs. They held that humans have the potential to continuously refine themselves and become more powerful throughout several Samsar cycles, with the last step of this evolution entailing that humanity break free from the gods. And secondly, the only gods currently in charge are the Celestial Ones and the Archons, which are subservient to Celestia. And the one god that sits atop this hierarchy is, as far as we know, the Primordial One. So, when the Ordo or Nabu Malikata claim that humanity needs to or will break free from the Divine, they are actually referring to the Primordial One and their rule. So, the god whose delusions humans need to rise up against is none other than the Primordial One. They are delusional, which means that they cannot be a descender, as delusion and reason cannot coexist. But that's not even the only evidence that we have of this. Caterpillar once said that creating humans with human knowledge can only be achieved by the gods. Honestly, this seemed like a very weird thing for him to say in the context of the world quests, but now I believe he was hinting at something much bigger. Knowledge goes hand in hand with reason. You cannot know a falsehood. You can only incorrectly believe it. Therefore, it is possible that what Cater was actually trying to convey is that humans can only be created through reason. Which is funny, because the Primordial One didn't actually create humans. It was a shade of life who did. Even funnier is the fact that this so-called God of Life seems to not be able to create life at all. They had to use the Primordial Seed to bring about new life forms. But the Sea was already doing that on its own. That's how life in Teyvat began. Funnier still, 
Egeria was the one creation of the shade that was made up entirely out of Tevatin elements. Everything else seems to contain elements that don't belong to this world, humans included. In his investigation notes, René claims that he and Jacob possess a constitution that more closely resembles that of the Sacred Lotus. That flower contains the pool of Amrita, which is one of the components that gave rise to the Kvarena. But according to René, Kvarena and Abyssal Energy might be one and the same, despite opposing each other. Remember, even Abyssal creatures can be corrupted by the Abyss. So, does this not suggest that René and Jacob had an Abyssal constitution? The Abyss isn't part of Tevat, but it is the source of delusion. So, hypothetically, if a god who lacks the reason needed to create humans wanted to do so regardless, they would have to get that creational power from somewhere else, like the Abyss, thus being forced to add these alien elements to their creations. And everything seems to check out when you bring the human realm and ermine soul into the mix. Flowers of Paradise Lost and the Order World quests both suggest that everything might be a dream. All of Tevat. A dream the Primordial One dreamed. A dream that, according to Nabu Malikata, is fated to collapse like all dreams do. Meaning that the human realm might not actually exist. Which admittedly makes a lot more sense than any other alternative. Because even though we were told that the Primordial One made the world anew, that's not really consistent with the timeline that we have unraveled thus far. The Dragon Sovereigns already reigned over seven nations, which already looked as they do now. Part of a pep Sumeru got turned into a desert during the Dragon War. You know, the war that was fought over the right to shape the world anew. But even after Heavenly Principles won, the desert didn't go anywhere. Everything remained as it was. So to recap, not only is it possible that Heavenly Principles didn't actually create the human realm and that it is all one giant dream, but they went to war to get the elemental authorities that would have allowed them to recreate Tevat in the first place. But a descender is a being whose will alone can create an entire world. If Heavenly Principles was a descender, they wouldn't need the authorities, but even with them, they were struggling to contain Tevat's natural order. But a descender is a being whose will alone can rival an entire world. So, no matter how you slice it, Heavenly Principles can't be a descender. Which means that they can't wield reason and anything of their making must have originated in delusion. Erminsol is no exception. In part 1, I discussed how the Silver Tree might not be able to record descenders because, being rooted in delusion, it is incompatible with reason. An easy counter-argument for this is that forbidden knowledge is massively destructive to it. But did we not just talk about how René seems to have believed that the Kavarena and Abyssal Energy are just two different forms of the same thing? And yet, they still counter each other. And like Enjo once told us, not even Abyssal beings are immune to the corruptive nature of the Void Realm. If I were to hold the delusional belief that the sky is purple, but you believed it is green, would those two delusions not counter each other? So even if Erminsol was created from delusion, that does not necessarily mean it would be immune to forbidden knowledge, and its very existence may just help us prove that the Primordial One is delusional. They might have been the ones to create the tree. The elemental life forms that used to live inside of a pep claim that they are so ancient, they probably predate any records. And what is Erminsol if not the ultimate record keeper? which means that Erminsol might not have been around before Heavenly Principles arrived. But whether or not the Primordial One created the tree, the truth is that the Celestial Gods can manipulate it to an alarming degree. Not only were they able to carve Fontaine's prophecy into Erminsol, but according to Nouvellet, it is the Usurper who decides and plays with the fate of living beings. That fate is determined by the constellations, which not only mirror the ley lines, but the fake stars may even be Erminsol's fruits. Truly, Erminsol is the control center of Tevat, which begs the question, why? What is the purpose of the tree? There are a great many possibilities, but in light of what we just discussed, Erminsol may have the single purpose of providing heavenly principles with reason. Which is not as crazy as it sounds. We know that Tevat is stuck in some kind of samsara, but the samsaras we have seen in the game so far had the purpose of collecting wisdom, knowledge. When the Academia decided to create a new artificial god, the first thing they did was farm the wisdom of the people. And if you think back to Caterpillar's little cryptic quote, 
Human knowledge might be reason. Dashrat seems to agree, because this plan was an idea that joined the wisdom of thousands and a great attempt at binding their dreams to power. If you think back to the battle against Shoki no Kami, when Nahida collected the wisdom of the people from her own samsara, it was stored inside a knowledge capsule. A golden one. Much like the Traveler's power. Humanity's true power may be their ability to reach reason through their wisdom. And if that is the case, Erminsol and Samsara may just be one huge plan to imbue heavenly principles with reason. But if they are actively trying to obtain reason, it means it isn't a natural power to them. And that in itself is the first key to proving my third accusation. The primordial one isn't Fanes. If you remember, Fanes also goes by the name Metis, thought. Thought and reason go hand in hand. And in Genshin, Fanes is very much meant to be a god of reason. And we know that because all five types of artifacts seem to represent the primordial one and the four shades. We have the flower of life for the shade of life, the plume of death for the shade of death, the goblet of you know them, which is a very weird translation as the original Chinese name more closely translates to void or space. So this is for the shade of void and or space. The sense of time for the shade of time, Istaroth. That leaves a circlet of logos for the primordial one. Logos is a Greek word that translates into reason, but it goes far beyond that, because according to ancient Greek philosophy, reason is what gives the universe form and meaning, and it is what governs it, which sounds exactly like the reason the senders are said to wield. So there is a very intentional link being drawn between the primordial one and reason, and it's not even the only one, because gnosis means knowledge. So, we have a god of reason that imparts knowledge to their subservient gods to help them rule their world. Very consistent, right? The only problem is that, just like we just discussed, the primordial one can't use reason. So what's going on? Is Fanes a lie? Is there no god of reason at all? No, there is. It's just that the primordial one isn't it. You might have already noticed that a very important change was made to the domains during 4.2, namely to the Erminsol roots in each domain. Previously, there had been five crowns hanging over the tree, one central larger one and two smaller ones on each side, representing the primordial one and the four shades. However, this arrangement has now been duplicated. We now have a second set of five crowns hanging over the old one. I try to reconcile these extra crowns with our current knowledge about Celestia, but it just doesn't work. It can't represent the thrones because there used to be seven and now six. That's still one too many. It can't be the Moon Sisters, because there were only three of them. Could there be more celestial gods we just aren't aware of? Or could these new crowns represent the true fanes and their shades? 4.2 was all about exposing a fake god and revealing the true god that had been orchestrating everything from the shadows all along. Do you really think the timing of this change was a coincidence? Because I sure as heck don't. In order for me to explain what I'm prattling on about, we need to turn to Gnosticism. Most of you are probably already aware of how this religion slash philosophical movement is referenced in Genshin, so I'll keep it brief. Gnosticism is really interesting because, unlike most organized religions, it doesn't really play with the concept of sin, punishment and the road to repentance. Instead, it centers around the idea that the material world is an illusion, a delusion if you will, and that you must attain enlightenment, knowledge, in order to reach salvation. Does that not sound exactly like what we just talked about? More interesting still is the reason why the material world is filled with illusions. Gnostics believe that there is a supreme, but hidden, creator god, the monad, meaning the one god. This god is the source of all pleroma, which is the sum of all divine powers and is referred to as the region of light. However, this original god split themselves through emanations that created new deities known as eons. Eons were usually created in male-female pairs called Sisygis. As shards of the monad, if you will, Eons also possessed divine powers, so it was their collective that formed the light region. The lower in the pleroma they were, the closer to darkness and the material world. The last emanation of the monad was Sophia, who gave birth to the Demiurge without permission. It depends on what Gnostic text you use as reference, but this entity is often seen as a malevolent, false and ignorant god who may either not know about the monad, or purposefully oppose it. Whatever the case, it exists outside of the pleroma, outside of true divinity. And it goes on to create the material world. It also creates seven archons meant to help it build and rule this flawed world, 
and humanity, because the Demiurge is the creator of humans. However, elements of the Pleroma fall into the bodies of humans, gifting them a soul and making them divine in nature. This is what the path to salvation in this religion entails. If humanity was to attain enough knowledge to recognize their own divinity, they would be able to enter the Pleroma. They would stand above the Demiurge. And for this reason, this entity makes a lot of efforts to keep humanity ignorant. Which sounds a lot like Celestia not tolerating human arrogation or allowing humans to question eternity, does it not? It also substantiates Nabu Malikata and Dashford's beliefs that gods have always been superfluous to humanity, because humans are true shards of divinity in their own right, unlike the fake god that sits Celestia's throne. Truly, this demiurge is a perfect parallel to the primordial one. On the other hand, the monad is also a perfect fit for Fanes, or at least a version of Fanes we were led to believe exists within Genshin. They are a god of knowledge, goodness and light, and they are capable of splitting themselves through emanations, which matches the creation of the shades really, really well. And if this is true, then we can finally claim that the primordial one isn't a true god, isn't a descender and isn't Fanes. We are living in the delusional Tevat because it was created by a flawed, false god. Humans have immense hidden potential that could allow them to wield reason, which might just be true divinity, because they have elements of the Pleroma within them. Slash oppresses humans to prevent them from escaping the physical realm and uses their divine essence to try to acquire true godhood. In truth, you could look at the whole Pleroma element speed under two different lights. It might just be the creative ability of the human mind, because if you remember, in part 1 I told you that, according to Elifas Levi's philosophy, the human mind was God, and these elements are what make humanity divine in nature. But according to other texts, these elements didn't simply fall from the Pleroma and into humanity. Instead, the Demiurge stole them from Sophia and trapped them within the humans. And that sounds a lot like the vision that Celestia gives out. We know that they benefit from having vision wheelers complete their purpose, so this weaves itself into the idea that Celestia is farming humanity for divinity very seamlessly. It all comes together really nicely, does it not? It makes sense. However, I'm not the first person to make these connections. <laughs> not by a long shot. But Fontaine gave us so much juicy lore that really strengthens this idea. I feel like we are finally able to put all the puzzle pieces together. There is just one missing. If the Primordial One isn't Fanes, then who are they? Yes, they are the Demiurge, but beyond that? The Battle Pass cuts in, Gnostic Chorus, is a rather ill-fitting piece of lore. It exists stranded in its own little island and makes some bold claims. It is narrated by Barbados, who tells us that this is our story, the story of our journey yet to be told. It appears that he's talking to us players as a proxy to the Traveler, and that this journey is the one that the second hair is undertaking. However, even though at first glance it may appear that it is about the twins, it really can't be. Yes, the two hairs look like Hither and Lumine, but the story is not sensitive to your chosen traveler. Both of them are the canon traveler, by the way. That is probably the one sentence I've said the most in my videos. Anyways, what I'm saying is that it's always the first female hair who is tempted by the serpent on her quest to retrieve the Genesis Pearl, which works out just fine if you chose Heather as your traveler, but if you chose Lumine, not so much. This is precisely why so many people have moved away from this interpretation, but it's not the only one. For starters, this cutscene perfectly matches the story Hymned of the Pearl, a passage from the Acts of Thomas text, which is part of the non-canon New Testament scripture. The only divergence is that, in this text, the main character, Thomas, is actually the second heir, though he's the one who originally goes to search for the pearl and is deceived. Hymned of the Pearl is often looked at as a Gnostic view of human condition, as humanity is part of divinity but is deceived by the material world and a demiurge to the point of forgetting their origins. Very clear, clean-cut parallels here. The problem is that this is also kind of a dead end that doesn't really allow us to figure out how the heirs and the kingdom of the heavens fit into the larger narrative. Another interpretation that does allow for that is that the first heir is actually Sophia. The two hairs could easily be a Sisugi, so it checks out in that regard. Moreover, Sophia being deceived and believing herself the queen of the Kingdom of Darkness could be a metaphor for her disobedience and creation of the Demiurge. The Demiurge is often represented as a serpent with the head of a lion, so it could be the serpent that deceived the first hair. In the Gnostic text Pistis Sophia, Christ, who is said to be Sophia's counterpart, the other half of her Sisugi, 
is sent to retrieve Sophia after the birth of Demiurge and to guide her back into the Pleroma. After that, Christ takes the form of a human and goes into the material realm to try and save humanity by disseminating spiritual knowledge. So it matches pretty well, right? If you discount the part where the gender of the hair is not traveler sensitive, this idea of the second hair, Christ, going to Earth as a human to free the people could even match up with the traveler's destiny, as they are meant to ascend and rule Devat. However, there is one big problem here. Because Sophia never believed herself queen. She was not ever a ruler or creator of the material realm. In fact, according to most texts, the Demiurge isn't even aware that she exists. There's also nothing to indicate that she was ever after a pearl. This entire description fits the Demiurge better, which means that it fits the primordial one. And really, the first hair being the primordial one is the only explanation that I can think of for the existence of the Genesis Pearl. It's really never brought up anywhere else. Well, not by that name. But we have heard of it already in, you guessed it, Fontaine. Thanks to Nouvellet, we now know that Heavenly Principles was using an absolute authority to suppress the natural order of Tivat before they were injured in the war with the second who came. Authority is the name given to the Dragon Sovereign's power over their elements. It quite literally allows them to bend the rules of reality within the limits of their element. For instance, after recovering his full power, Nouvellet was able to turn the fake blood made from the primordial sea that ran in the veins of the Fontanians into real blood. Because all of it fell within the realm of Hydra. Essentially, if you have an elemental authority, you have partial control over Tivat. But Heavenly Principles had absolute authority, because they vanquished all of the Dragon Sovereigns. If you put together all seven partial authorities, you get the ultimate one. This is the power that war was fought over. It's a substitute for reason. Something that allows the victor to reshape the world and suppress its natural order. And it's draconic in origin which may just tell us what the authorities look like. According to Chinese and Japanese folklore, pearls are the source of a dragon's power. And now we have the Pearl of Genesis, meaning the origin, creation, which, just like the absolute authority, could allow one to make a world anew. What's more, the Pearl of Genesis is placed within a shell, and wrapped around that shell is a serpent. The Greek veins was born with a serpent wrapped around him, and it is said that the animal was meant to represent Earth, Meanwhile, the first hair, after being deceived by the serpent for getting her origins, crowns herself Queen of the Kingdom of Darkness, which is one of the descriptions given to the material realm created by the Demiurge. So if the first hair is the primordial one, the Gnostic Chorus has told us, in a very metaphorical way, the story of Celestia's origins. She would have arrived in Tevat, the material realm, represented by the serpent. There, she would forget her origins and believe herself the one creator deity, Fanes. However, lacking the power to control this world, she would have sought out the Genesis Pearl, leading her to create her shades, as though she was the one true god, so she could go to war against the sovereigns and claim the pearl in order to refashion Devat and create humanity. From there, recognizing a spark of true divinity within her imperfect creation, she and her shades would begin to act as oppressors, even creating the Archons to keep a closer eye on humanity. All for the purpose of farming that divinity and claiming the power she believed to be rightfully hers. This still doesn't really explain who the second hare is at the moment, but it is possible he could have been the second who came, as they are both described to be thrones of the heavens, and from what little we do know of them, even though they went to war, the second ended up helping the primordial one, like quarrelsome siblings. Still, if this is the right interpretation, this story could be about the Traveler even if they aren't the second hair. If the only reason they made their way to Tevat was because they were summoned by the heavens, and if their destiny is to take over Slash's role while freeing humanity, then it would all have begun when Slash was created. It would be the prologue of their story. <sighs> okay, that was a long one, especially when you consider this is a two-parter. But I hope you enjoyed, and if you stuck around until the end, leave a goat emoji in the comments because you are the goat and I'm now legally required to find you and provide you with a digital cookie as a thank you. What do you think about this whole mess? It's insane how much the Narcissus and Quest quests completely reframed how I see the lore in its entirety. It's not even just about discovering new stuff, but also altering or cementing past theories. So I'd love to hear your takes on Celestia and how they have evolved as new lore is revealed. That's all for today. 
Sorry about my voice, by the way. I'm sick and I think you can hear it. Anyway, I'll be off now. My name is Vlu and I'll see you again soon. Safe journey, travelers.